Now in early 2010, I was part of a focus group for Nokia, giving feedback on their software functions and upcoming hardware. The models I handled that day didn't have obvious names, but there were two cantilevered QWERTY designs that I was immediately drawn to. The smaller one appeared as the Symbian powered Nokia E7 in 2010, and I've got one here. Fabulous little device in many ways, but it was the larger one with the flat keyboard surface that I hoped would get released. And it did in a very limited run as the Nokia N950 running Mego. They only made 5,000 and they got sent out to developers. I had one for a bit and I loved it. They were so rare though. Among the N950's fans was Lian Chen Chen, who was also an E7, even Nokia N97 fan before that, like me. And he loved the form factor so much that when Motorola came out with the Z series and the extensible mod system, he tried to set up manufacturing of a snap-on Moto mod that offered the same cantilevered keyboard. The Moto mod never got as far as production, sadly, but Lian Chen wanted to take things further, so he set up a company. FX Technology with the idea of making the N950 form factor but with modern internals and running Android. Wow! And here it is, the first production FX Tech Pro 1 after eight months of prototypes and several recent updates to its stockish Android 9 experience to fix touch response bugs. So ignore issues reported by others from late last year. This seems pretty solid now from both the software and a hardware point of view. In fact, you could argue it's too solid, by which I mean that the metal cantilever mechanism so precisely aligned when closed that getting it started when opening up is actually quite hard. You have to press hard with both thumbs on the bottom edge and then press a bit harder still on curved glass, remember, and then it finally opens with a wrench, the metal underside of the display slamming against a couple of small rubber stops. Maybe the violence is okay, but it's a little disconcerting. Plus there's always the worry about dropping the Pro 1 every time opening is attempted. Do not do this in the street over a concrete pavement. Mm -hmm. However, you do get used to the opening system. There's a knack to it. And to be fair, almost everything in the phone is usable in landscape mode with the keyboard open. So you don't have to keep closing the Pro one to do other stuff. The full five row QWERTY keyboard is better than it looks. And once the muscle memory is built up, I think you can get to similar speeds to other physical keyboard gadgets. Think BlackBerry Key 2 from the modern age or those old Nokias. It won't be faster than modern autocorrect, auto-suggest software keyboards like Gboard though, so buying the Pro 1 in order to type faster is a myth. The whole point here isn't speed, it's three things. Number one, with the keyboard available, applications can take up the whole screen. There's always more to work with, more to reply to, more context that you can input text more productively. Number two, there's the mindset. With the display propped up at 155 degrees and the keyboard profit, you'll feel more productive. <laughs> the Pro One is a serious tool. You should be doing more email, more spreadsheets and so on. Yes, you can still play games in open or closed mode, but you'll feel <clears throat> guiltier. Number three, a built-in stand for watching media. Maybe it's just me that likes my screen popped up playing YouTube while having breakfast, but 155 degrees works for me. The preponderance of aluminium does mean weight though, 245 grams. Though the curved screen and curved corners all round do mean that the Pro One never feels crazily awkward in the hand. On the right is a power button and a separate capacitive finger scanner. Odd that the two aren't combined, which is very odd, but you can hold your finger on the latter to authenticate and power the display on, so it just takes uh, getting used to. The scanner isn't the fastest I've seen, about a second to scan, recognize and take action. One annoyance is that casual brushes against the scanner when holding the phone when off all count towards scan attempts. So when you actually need to authenticate, it says maximum number of attempts exceeded. Please use the pin, which kind of falls the point. There's another button below this a camera launcher, and this works very well indeed, even when the screen is otherwise locked off. You can't take photos using this, though, which seems by design as then you'd be jerking the phone down as you press. Better to use the good but slow camera you are here and then your screen presses are in line with the photo's direction, so there will be less motion blur. We're talking an average 12 megapixel shooter with no OIS, mind you, so don't expect the Earth. In practice, I was happy with the results, especially for a productivity-based device. There seems to be some intelligent, possibly accelerometer based in terms of taking shots in tricky low light situations, but there was some shutter lag. Hopefully this can be optimised away.
And hey, the imaging is worlds better than on the Cosmo Communicator uh, previously featured. Genuine stereo speakers matched at top and bottom grills. Well, they're a nice touch that there's no Dolby Atmos built in. So everything's, well, just a tiny bit flat for a speaker connoisseur like myself. I want more bass, more top end. I know it's only a phone, but still. A wired audio through, yes, a 3.5mm jack is very good. Punchy and loud. It's not clear yet whether this is the Snapdragon 835's built-in DAC or a custom DAC, but results are good anyway. Well done, FX technology. 128 gigabytes of storage plus micro SD if you don't need the second nano SIM slot plus six gig of RAM all means there's plenty of capacity and speed here. Okay, we're not talking 2020 flagship performance, but it's easily and comprehensively fast enough. The Snapdragon 835 is two years old, yes, but that's how long it takes to get specialist devices like this off the ground. It goes without saying there's no waterproofing here, just way too many mechanical openings internally. There's also no Qi charging, but that's down to the device already being thick enough at 14 millimetres. The battery's 3200 milliamp hours, seems to get through the day, and there's quick charge 3.0 support. The keyboard does have some nice touches, such as a caps lock LED and full backlight, though this is kept relatively low intensity so as not to drain too much power. If you never use your Pro One in low light, you can actually disable the backlight completely, by the way. I rather liked it. Security here is September 2019 and November is apparently on the way, which isn't too bad. It's also worth noting for hardcore geeks that the bootloader is open, so you can choose to install Lineage or Sailfish OS on this for a really, really niche bit of kit. There's a lot more here that's positive than negative, I feel. Look past the ergonomics of actually opening the mechanism you're down to nitpicks like some android applications such as instagram not working in landscape mode and thus being a pain in laptop mode here and the price 650 pounds not including shipping is higher than i'd like but i do have some understanding of the huge amount of work needed to get something like this made and just as with the gemini pda and the cosmo if your heart beats faster when you see this thing when you see the FX Tech Pro 1, then I suspect the price won't actually matter.